Welcome to Sunday Sessions, 5th of July, 2020. Well, thank you for joining us for another Sunday Sessions. It's a little bit uh, wobbly today because the internet's been going on and off and I've been told by West Connect, uh, our suppliers, that that might go on. So should this break up and uh, I'm talking to just thin air, I'll come back and I'll do the rest that I haven't covered. But please leave in the comments how this is because the speed is still quite low. Are you actually hearing me, uh, seeing me okay? Let me know in the comments and I'm gonna check up uh, very soon. What I, this is going to be a kind of, uh, perhaps more than 30 minutes, going to be a very pictorial Sunday session. Uh, there's no live guests because no one came forward with a willingness to share their sanctuary garden or sanctuary forest uh, uh, this week. Then maybe we'll have someone next week. So it's me and a few pictures. I uh, hope you'll enjoy that. But normally on the Sunday sessions, uh, as the regulars of you will know, we cover tree law and all water law and she, uh, and woodland tree and garden sanctuaries, which is the whole point of the sanctuaries, to allow the imagination and to be inspired by what you actually believe in. And uh, we also have uh, sometimes a, a side dish of uh, storytelling and poetry. Now today is a sort of a follow-up to the um, us and trees that we covered last March. I don't know if any of you joined us for that one. Uh, in this, in, but in this session, I intend to cover uh, sixteen reasons why, uh, why woodlands and forestry are very important to us, and we're going to have some uh, a bit on uh, nature journaling and what that could become for you. And I'm uh, towards the end. I'm going to actually have a short revisit to the Austin trees that we presented last March. Now, uh, William Blake himself, there he is, uh, he actually said, uh, if I can get something up for you to read, uh, the tree which moves some tears of joy is in the eye of others. Only a green thing stands in the way. Some see nature. Let's see if I can get the rest of it up for you. And, because it's a bit small, but anyway, let's say some see nature as all ridicule and deformity, and some scarce see nature at all. But to the eyes of the man of imagination, nature is imagination itself. Now, let's see what, uh, uh, let's get me back on. Um, let's see what your, uh, anyone there. Hello, Donna. Uh, good morning from uh, New Mexico. Nice to see you. Deborah Flynn, hearing okay. Good to hear. Kimberly's back. Fantastic. Hello, Kimberly, uh, Boston. I'm glad that you're all here. Uh, I suppose it's not so important that you see me. Uh, well, you might not see much of me because I'm going to be uh, uh, putting a lot of comments. Now, I'm going to... Let's get this going. There we go. Now, what I'm going to be doing, and again, one of these days, I'll, I'll find out what buttons I'm supposed to be doing. Anyway, we're getting there. We're getting there. Great. Um, this uh, first part that I'm doing uh, is taken from a tree hugger uh, article I posted last week. And the tree hugger article was 21 reasons why forests are important. I'm actually going to go through 16 of them. And I'm going to adapt some of these to uh, the benefits of our tree sanctuaries and uh, hopefully building some uh, for yourself. The first important thing is that um, it's not just about trees. Uh, there's a lot more than, uh, than trees. Um, uh, for a start, 50% of all life on Earth uh, is in the forests. And 80% uh, is of all biodiversity, as we call it, is actually in the forest as well. Um, let's get my biodiversity picture up. 
And the, the one thing that we perhaps are not so much aware of, this, there's still people that are living in forests. And it's about 5% of the population still do. There we go. There's a visual of, of some of the 5% uh, right there. But as we know, perhaps from today, trees create rain. Although we look around us in, in Ireland anyway, there's a lot of rain. And we're kind of thinking uh, that, uh, well, <laughs> um, where's the trees? There we go. Oh, the rain. This is the whole point. Uh, can we have more trees planted? Uh, but because of this rain, it means that all our non-forest farmland, our gardens especially, that's where we sort of connect with, they very much uh, depend on this. And the one thing that's very important as well and is how uh, we found that here at Karakrori that uh, it was a bogland where the tree labyrinth is and when we, as soon as we got the order and the willows, which are great uh, tree drinkers, uh, great tea drinkers, yes, we're going to do a lot of tea drinking in there. Uh, water drinkers, that it took all the bog out, uh, it took all the water out of the bog there. And it's now very walkable, uh, very important. It's wonderful. And so the groundwater is, this is what happened in the tree labyrinth. It sucked up uh, through the roots, stored in the tree, and uh, the canopy evaporates into the air, so it doesn't, it stops, it sends the water back up into the sky, into the clouds, and prevents the flooding. And it's something that's very much uh, underestimated. And the one thing that trees do is they help keep us cool. And by uh, keeping us cool and creating an oasis of shade, it helps buildings to stay cool, it renew, uh, reduces the need for air conditioners, electric fans, or just trying to keep ourselves cool. So obviously it helps the uh, keep the earth cool as well. And uh, trees absorb CO2, the fuel. You know, we all hear often CO2, how it fuels the global warming. And plants always need that CO2 for the uh, global synthesis, photosynthesis. But the earth is so thick with the emissions, and this is something that's been talked about through the lockdown, obviously, that um, the extra emissions of forests, they actually are helping to fight the global warming just by breathing it in. So there's so much, look at that nice spirally uh, tree there. I'm not sure what the species, whether it is a kind of you, but uh, it stores, the CO2 gets stored in the wood, and it can actually stay there uh, for centuries, which I'm sure it has been in that uh, and that's another thing here with the tree labyrinth that we've got it prevents erosion we got a hedge of alder because the soil here is much higher than the field beside us and i was thinking go get get some rain like we've been getting in this bog we're soon going to lose our topsoil and even lose our trees it's going to go into the next field and the alder has absolutely been uh, phenomenal and the reason being uh, it's been so good, good is the order has a, a wonderful, well, this isn't order here. I think that's a bit of you or something like that. But it has a lovely, tight, woven root network that goes along as a boundary on our soil. So it keeps everything up uh, on in our labyrinths. Nothing flows down to the field. Something very important to uh, keep an eye on. Um, and then noise reduction, uh, that's uh, a thing that uh, people are considering a lot is uh, if, the, especially people in Dublin, uh, by the M50, it gets wider and wider, wider, busier and busier. How do you keep the noise out? How do you keep the noise out from the extra airplanes? Well, they're not happening now, but around Dublin airport. And uh, the, it really um, is incredible the amount of uh, blockage you see from the chart there. I, th I think it can reduce um, as much as 50% of sound uh, just by having a good uh, barrier of trees there. Very useful. So that's a, a something that's a, a important. And also, uh, as it's great for bl uh, blocking the wind. And that's we've got a, a wind block here, and it's a westerly wind today. So I certainly am appreciating that because we're getting less here. It's going to 
less likely it's going to knock any trees down in the tree labyrinth or blow any of the plants around. Uh, so groups of trees serve as a windbreak, and a lot of farmers forget this. Uh, and it, the trees are protective against wind-sensitive uh, crops. And it's also a, a buffer that makes it easy for the bees to keep pollinating. Uh, the flowers are not just flapping around in the wind. They can actually be landable still uh, through the protection from a barrier from trees. And the bats and birds are there. They come out and eat the insects on the crops and the owls and the foxes eat the rats that also eat the crops. So again, it's this biodiversity that really helps. And I just am puzzled why farms don't actually put more concentration on the tree barriers, the hedge barriers, because of all the incredible benefits. Even if they've just got pasture for cattle, it's amazing the hidden benefits all round. Uh, but the one thing we can, uh, oh, another one. I haven't got a picture for this one, so I'll lift, uh, I'll lift this one up. But um, the one thing about uh, trees is they, they're really good at cleaning up uh, polluted soil. And especially that gauze, that beautiful yellow flower gauze. If you've got a polluted area like where there's been a mine, um, put the gauze in. And the gauze is wonderful with its roots to actually transform a polluted area into a clean area. So it's like the internal operations of the gauze of the furs. It's like the intestines of a crow or a raven where they can eat pollutants and churn it all up. And then when they poop, it's perfectly safe organic matter. And again, that's all part of the essential biodiversity. And uh, the same way, uh, it'll clear up uh, the air. Uh, do I have something for air? No, I don't have anything for air. Okay. Uh, but the airborne pollutants, carbon monoxide, we hear a lot about that. Trees will absorb that, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide. And it's reckoned because of this absorption, if you've got plenty of trees in an urban environment, it can save hundreds of lives per year in most countries. And of course, that will save a lot of heartache and the millions spent on healthcare that just by removing pollutants from the air by uh, the trees. Muffled noise pollution, I've mentioned about that one. Um, as well as the muffling, keeping away the road and the airplane noises, what we find areas taking in is the rustling of leaves and the, uh, all that lovely woodland white noise, the bird song, and just a few extra trees in a garden. Uh, can cut out that background sound by as much as 50%, as I was saying. And you've got that wonderful mindfulness situation where you can wipe out all these exterior sounds and you've got the bird song and you've got the rustling leaves uh, in your ears instead. The one thing that people are very aware of is how uh, uh, tree species, they, they feed us. And of course, this is what you'll find around trees, not directly from the trees. The blackberries, uh, brambles, they're doing quite well. They'll be out soon. There's some wild strawberries about. The bilberries will be uh, available. Oh, we've got a picture of those too. There we go. And then we'll have the bilberries. Um, but there's uh, nuts. Uh, there's various young leaves. This is another subject, but certainly look into the foraging, eat weeds, Websites are a very good one to actually learn about that. But one thing uh, that we really know about the woodlands and about the forests is that they how they heal us just by what we can forage. And they serve so many natural medications. And I'm going to do a, a Sunday session where you can be very instinctive when you have some sort of ailment or you're not feeling quite right. It's amazing how your intuition and how your instinct can guide you uh, just to what's needed for you. Because if you think about it, every animal doesn't, isn't able to look up a book and read a book to find out what remedy is going to cure them. They can actually identify just by the look of a plant, of a flower, the smell, and just by the initial taste, by just the grip of their teeth. And we can do those things too. But um, well, there's been a lot of talk during the lockdown. What about the people with cancer? Because there's a lot of people... Unfortunately, the pathway with cancer that have to do with the COVID. 
And 70% of known plants, it says, uh, have got cancer fighting properties. And uh, they come from the thick forests. And there's a lot of many articles about how important the rainforests are for getting uh, attention uh, and our access to these known plants. And I read somewhere that only 1% of plants in tropical rainforests have been tested to see what the medicinal effects are. But you will know that just walking through the woods can offer health benefits too, including uh, stress relief and uh, reduced blood pressure and stronger immune system. And there are people now that call themselves forest bathing practitioners and they teach that some evergreen trees release, release airborne compounds uh, called phytoncides and that prompts our bodies to boost natural killer cells and attack the T cells uh, that attack the infections and they guard us uh, against the tumors. And I certainly am aware, and I'm sure a lot of you are, that if you, if you actually go amongst pine, uh, among, in a pine woodland, very, very, very good for, uh, for this. Um, this is not pine woodland. This is going on to the next thing. Because the one thing about uh, trees is to provide incredible craft materials. And this is a display of work by a friend, uh, uh, Phil Cronell. He actually lives, I think it's a 17 acre woodland. So he's got all these trees around him. He lives in a mobile home, got an incredible sophisticated studio. And uh, he ha has horses that's in his woods and uh, just drags the woods to his studio and out comes past. Uh, just like this, phenomenal thing. So uh, it's materials, and of course we use for building. There's there's someone else there. Uh, so where would we be without wood and resin? Because it's been hundreds, if not thousands of years, that people have used, humans have used woodland uh, as a renewable source, and more recently for paper as well as for furniture, for homes, also for clothing. Unfortunately, by the crafting and materials, we do get a bit carried away, of course, because of the increasing population puts more demands on the woodlands. So we get overuse, deforestation is faster than forestry replacement. And so we've got to learn more about sustainable forestry. And that means that anything to do with tree farming is uh, one heck of a debate, isn't it? But really, when it comes down to it, Trees, there we go, I love this one. Pillars of the community. Trees are really pillars of our community. Trees, woodlands, uh, forests, they really tie everything together, don't they? And we, and we don't really seem to appreciate this until they're gone. They're really the main uh, setting for our life on land and I can't see how humans could survive without them. They're really taken for granted. And this is why I say it's essential, start small. A lot of people say, how can they rescue uh, the forests? How can they actually do something to stop people taking away uh, acres, hectares, several football fields full of woodlands? What can we do to actually stop these lumbering people do that? Well, I think we've not got much authority on that until we eventually put our own tree sanctuary together. And through a tree sanctuary, the most important thing is to help us explore, relax, and be inspired. Now there's a, a new buzzword I've been reading about, I don't know if you've been catching it, uh, biophilia. It's said to be the invisible enchantment that draws us to trees, woods, and forests. That it can, being in the woods rejuvenates ourselves as we explore, wander, and we unwind within the wilderness. And of course, with the stories and the Sunday session subjects that come up, I encourage the idea of the enchantment by the, the she and the fairy folk and the fae folk. And all this imagination and the presence of, of what we have faith in and believe in is an enchantment that just serves us with a lovely sense of wonder and questions that we can never really answer and it's invigorating uh, as we tread through these wild frontiers that we imagine that have all been molded by our ancestors. 
Now, due to the uh, growing awareness of this biophilia and enchantment, many people are now seeking out a bit more clarity in their engaging in the benefits. Um, we have these practitioners uh, that are popping up everywhere uh, of a modern transformed version of the Japanese practice of Shimon Yoko. Uh, well, this is developed as a practice in Japan. It's quite recent, really. It was developed for stressed urban workers and it's been around since the early 80s and now commonly translated as forest bathing. But sadly, it's, what's been practiced is very different to what they do in Japan. That would be another Sunday session to explain that. So that I th I, sadly, I think this idea of forest bathing is being a bit too exploited uh, by uh, as a kind of industry. Some people are, I'm amazed how, uh, how people are charging a fortune for taking people into the woods and show them how to be mindful of the sounds and presence and smells and the whole synthesis of their senses. I'll come back to this uh, picture I got now. Uh, I'm going to go uh, press the right button and I'm going to go into your comments and I press the wrong button. Here we go again. And I will leave that for a second. And, and hello, <laughs> back again. Uh, how are we doing here? I, I what do you, we've got Donna going here. We got, uh, oh, you you really you're kind of uh, I, whoa. You're you're really busy. Thank you very much. Uh, Kimberly is there. What we got? We got the star. Good morning for New York. Great to see you, Margaret. Hello there. Um, mad, wild, and windy in Mulliga. Yeah, I think for a lot of uh, Ireland, it certainly is. And Margaret says she's actually pine tree. Yes, the pine trees are wonderful, especially when pine trees are pollinating. The, uh, the pine pollen is very uh, invigorating. And uh, I think now people are actually collecting them. It's becoming a kind of a, a bit of a trendy thing in the health food shops. But they, as long as you're not too allergic to the things, anything pine, breathing it in, rub it again, you, it's invigorating, especially if you've got aches and pains and stiffness. I think pine is perhaps... One of the old remedies that's not as popular as it was, it, it seemed everybody lived with pine. It was a strong association. I don't know if that's been because of the length of time I was in Scotland, and of course it's pine everywhere there. Uh, there's uh, Dame Amory, lovely. Hi, John, interesting. I've just finished the book on, on trees, about trees. There we go. Uh, Look up uh, Dame Amory. She's uh, got uh, quite a website. She gets quite a few books out. Um, there we go. Someone else reading a uh, great book is reading the New England landscape. Now, there's one thing, a, a point here, and I'm not always bringing this up um, with this. And uh, one of the main points, I think, uh, of a tree sanctuary is to... Don't take your books into the tree sanctuary. Uh, there's a story from years ago. My father, he was quite into um, fire walking. And I, I must admit, uh, uh, the fire walking is amazing when you do it right. Uh, the transformation in just a few seconds when you go across the embers is quite phenomenal. And uh, he was up in the hills north in India, and he was with a bunch of shamani type folk, and they were preparing for the... Uh, to go uh, walk the uh, coals or the embers uh, for a fire walk. And there was this very Christian man, and he just said, oh, you're playing with the devil, you're playing with the devil and all that. And he was holding his Bible, and he was doing his Bible bashing. So, of course, everybody was going across the fire walk perfectly safe, as when you're actually 100% sensory focused on a fire walk, you're not going to have any harm done to you. And that's where the lesson is, is suddenly... You do take all the chattering out of your mind and brain, and it's just you and your sensory presence. And that's what you got to survive and trust and believe in. And nobody was harmed. They just went across, transformed, amazing visions. Man with the Bible, he goes walking across the embers with his Bible open and reciting something out of the Bible, and his feet burned. And uh, that, I think... When you distract it, I think to me, uh, books are often a verification. And I think books are wonderful as a trigger on the imagination as well. That 
Don't be afraid that when you get that imagination that you run with it, you do something with it. I think when you stay strictly to the text on the book, you're going to give yourself trouble because you become servitude to that book. And I believe a time in a tree sanctuary and one of the main benefits of a tree sanctuary is definitely to give yourself a space and a place. Uh, and even a garden sanctuary, I say tree sanctuary, some people get it's just standing on a, an isolated coast on the beach. But to have that space where it's just you and that voice within you and trust in the instinct, which is all any other species of animal really has. If you think and you see deer and foxes and badgers and rats and pine martins, that's all they've got to go on. So be like those and let your own wisdom uh, come from this. Um, so don't become over-reliant on the books, but books are wonderful as a, an aid, I believe, uh, that if you're stuck for ideas and reading someone else's ideas and suddenly your own ideas, it helps you to unlock and run away with them. Absolutely fantastic. Um, so what we got? Uh, about forest bathing, certain trees good against getting uh, cancer because they emanate certain... Well, yes, there is that too. Uh, it'd be another uh, session for that. Uh, dancing trees. <laughs> uh, right, yeah, the crooked trees. I thought that was a lovely picture. I didn't know where to place it, so that was uh, what I did for that. Uh, okay, good day. Uh, good day. Oh, how are you doing? Um, what we got? Oh, we got Sherry here. Sorry, I've got so much light on me. I'm having a struggle. I read a lot of trees on the farm. The Crohn's Farm and Fibre Studio, wonderful. And uh, I've not heard of collecting pine pollen. Yeah, well, I say anything to do with uh, pines, but when you, uh, the pine's full of pollen in, in the spring, late spring, and you just touch the coals, whoosh, you get this cloud of sort of yellow dust. Unfortunately, people that have uh, the hay fever, that's a nightmare for them, but I absolutely love it. You sort of, it, it, you inhale that uh, close up if you're able to, and it's an incredible tonic just then. Uh, it's funny, the hay fever people, can suddenly feel a bit congested. If you don't have that, you're suddenly very clear. Uh, so it's great for clarity and as a tonic. Um, ah, the thin places. Yeah, the thin places to me uh, is when you allow the place. I think everywhere it can be thin. It's you allowing yourself to be recognition that you are connected, you are part of all in nature. You're not separated from nature and just joining it. It's allowing yourself to stop being in denying, in denial of being part of nature. And I think to me, a thin place is when you let your egos go and uh, you stop denying that you're part of nature. When you do that, you're suddenly connected and you might even feel that uh, you're on another realm. realm. So I think I'll continue this a bit. Uh, let's see what we are. Okay, now, keeping a nature journal. That's the next uh, next bit. Let's see, I've, got, I've still got a, a thing here. There we go. I'll get to, there we go, nature journal. Uh, uh, that's back to that. Right. Um, now, this one was I was reading last week um, based on uh, I hope you don't mind me keeping you a bit longer. As I say, this is going to be longer than usual uh, Sunday sessions. And uh, it was some work, a uh, writer, and she has retreats. Uh, Mary Reynolds Thompson, um, she has the Reinventing Home blog. And uh, it was Ina Gorman who linked me to this, uh, an article on nature journaling. And this is really venturing. Nature journaling is wonderful as a means for, come on, uh, venturing into the wild and finding our place within it. That's down in the Glen, uh, in, uh, outside of uh, Strand Hill. And it's where we discover the wildness uh, in ourselves. And there we go. Uh, we should get something else, some, some couple of people there finding the wildness in themselves and having a, a, a conversation. But it's um, being in the woods, uh, I, to me, or forest, woodland, or your own tree sanctuary, 
is that one place where we discover, rediscover the sanctuary that's within ourselves. And uh, I think it's at that point, one of the things we certainly do is write about the nature that we're in communion with, that whole realm that we can't really put into words. It's so difficult to put into words. Some people find it, as I mentioned, I think it was last week, some people find it so difficult putting the, uh, their feeling and their senses and the integration into words that uh, they might get frustrated with the writing. So what they do is they do a bit of painting. Um, or they might go, like Phil has been doing, is crafting uh, wood. And every living thing that's around us, um, it tends to contribute to our perspective of life. Come on up. There we go. Uh, our perspective of life at that moment. And this is a, a lovely page from someone's uh, nature journal, I think uh, is really beautiful there. But what we do when we're there, especially by ourselves, is we pay attention to the nature sound. And for some people, if they've deprived themselves of that, it might be the first time that they've done something like this since their childhood. There's a whole lovely synthesis, and this is the beauty of it, allowing ourselves that moment, the synthesis of our sight, sound, smell, touch and taste. And then we go and write about it, and everything seems to... Ex uh, everything around us seems to express itself through us. That's just the main satirical take on that bit of our uh, expression. But really, our whole chattering linear language uh, fades away and everything kind of feels airy and a spiral and everything seems to go into a spiral from the linear and repeats itself in cycles and by doing so and being aware of this and and kind of denying taking ourselves away from this i could do a whole session on time and space i don't believe in either just this whole spiral of how things unfold if you think of things of nature that do involve evolve into spirals. Even the universe itself goes around in a spiral. If you enter astrology and you read about the great year, uh, fascinating stuff. But the one thing we do when we're in uh, a synthesis of senses, we seem to follow a rhythm uh, in everything. And we tend to uh, become part of the entire orchestra of it all. And that to me is a sort of an essence of, we're going to do a, a Sunday session on journal on that, because once you're out in what people call nature, which is really being ourselves, don't be afraid to mix your media, your writing, your drawing, your observations, even mapping out uh, what's around you. Anyway, as I say, that was an introduction by Mary Reynolds Thompson. Unfortunately, I was going to do a banner to link, but I don't have that um she has books courses and retreats so if you remember that mary a lot of you are probably familiar with her anyway mary reynolds thompson.com mary reynolds thompson.com uh so look her up that's where i got the the inspiration to talk to you a little bit about uh, nature journaling so uh before i come on to the next uh, bit the third bit and see uh, what you're having to say uh, here, uh, there's Kimberly back again. Uh, oh, a chew for me. <laughs> oh, sorry. I live in Pine and Oak Grove. Two trees. I'm. Oh, it's a shame about the oaks, too. Nine. nine oh, well, at least you found a way around it. The uh, pine needle vinegar. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, bee pollen in health food stews. Bee pollen, that's another subject again. Uh, just shows how important it is for the bees, isn't it? And I have a pine tree. Well, if you've got uh, the bee pollen and pine pollen together, obviously that's going to be fantastic uh, combination. So uh, fabulous. That page. Yeah, Mary Reynolds uh, there. I, uh, I can't forget the name already. I hope you've uh, remembered that. 
let's see. <laughs> the visit to the giant. Oh, the Glen. All oh, right, very good. Yes, I think I might have one or two more pictorial parts of the Glen uh, coming up to explain some stuff. But I'll move on with the third thing here, and uh, it's, it is the revisit uh, to the Arson Trees. Uh, a bit of a recap from what we covered in, and I got a separate uh, site on that. Arsentrees.com. I must admit, I haven't been working on updating that very much because if I'm not in the garden or in the tree labyrinth, and I tend to be sorting out the next Sunday session, but there's so much extra content to go up on the Austin Trees that uh, I look forward to getting back on that again. But uh, a short recap on a few things that I bring up on that. Um, now, uh, one of the main inspiration of that uh, was going to a wonderful festival that obviously is not going to be on this year. It was, um, it was a woodland festival that was put on by the Western Forestry Corp uh, in Le County Leitrim um, in the south. I'm trying to think of the place, uh, Kilbragan. Uh, anyway, I was amazed. Thousands of people turned up. I think it should be organized as they were expecting a few hundred. Uh, but uh, let's, uh, I have to, let's get back to the buttons here. There we go. So you can read. There we go. Please, no commercial monoculture. Definitely not. Uh, but uh, one of the lectures I went to was, if Ireland had 25% forest cover, we would actually be carbon neutral. And that was uh, one, in one of their lectures. And I, I sort of pondered over that. And I, I wondered uh, now, okay, 25%, again, that's larger than life for most of us. How do we do that? You know, we might be saying, oh, we might sort of march the streets or sign hundreds of petitions. We want more tree cover. I look at this, you know, what can we personally do? What can we actually do on the piece of land we got? What can we do with our neighbors if we're in an apartment? And what is the things that we can actually do? Let's break this down with the population of Ireland. What does this mean? And it actually means having a quarter of an acre per person to be carbon neutral. Uh, there's, um, there, if you go to the uh, usandtrees.com, I have a resource there that actually, ha I forget the name of hand, but it has a, a set of calculators on websites. So I, I used a set of calculators uh, to uh, work out what was going on in the tree labyrinth garden here because it is a quarter of an acre and it's a home of 300 uh, mixed trees and um, here uh, uh, most of the trees now are over 10 years old and the oxygen from that tree labyrinth uh, when I use the calculator because you put in how many miles uh, kilometers you drive uh, in a month or a week, I think it was, and how much fuel you use up. And when I calculated that out, just from that quarter of an acre, I was absolutely shocked and delighted that the tree labyrinth actually gave off, um, uh, it, uh, it actually absorbed more CO2 than the outputs caused by me driving around and using energy in the home. I thought, that was brilliant. So how can we do the same or better? So I'll go into this a lot. Uh, in the uh, usandtrees.com. But for now, let's think about how to, how do we actually do this from a small crop of trees, our own tree sanctuary, our own forest garden. And it's very, very important to actually be in a tree filled space. And we do not feel that it's an industrial enterprise. This is something that's extremely important. Important. How do you get access to a quarter of an acre of land, especially if you live in an apartment? And I, I say, go back, go to usandtrees.com, and I explain more of that. But I'm thinking in terms of tree sanctuary. How do you be involved in the tree sanctuary, even in the creation, uh, or helping other people create something similar? And that's your quarter of an acre sorted out, and as you see. These are a whole bunch of pictures of us uh, planting the tree labyrinth garden, which at the time, it wasn't an industrial idea. I didn't know that when it was 10 years old that it would be sequestering uh, the amount of CO2 that I was using driving around. I wasn't thinking of those terms. I just wanted a tree sanctuary uh, to share with other people. And 
have gone into the arguments of making a geometric structure, which in a way is against the flow of nature, but somehow nature has flowed into it. And I think I flowed into uh, that structure as well. And I know if I went away for two or three months, Nate, uh, the rest of what's living here uh, will say, aha, we can change all this and there wouldn't be any labyrinth left. But it isn't anything to do with control, I don't think. I think it's all about whatever life is present in that labyrinth, we all share the decisions uh, and the cultivation and the stewardship. So, of course, when being a human and humans like to create things and humans love circles in geometric construction, of course, I, I suppose I tend to command these things, but I've seen it when hairs come along. And when hairs come along, they see a circle. What do they do? They hop around the circles. And I, I've seen that with birds as well. So everybody, you, you make things, create things, and everything joins in. And of course, what the other life does and what birds do, they all join in. There's the manuring, uh, there's the way they change, they bring seeds that's, that grow new things that hadn't been planned, and you just let them grow and continue. Uh, so, how do you really get started? How do you become a, a tree woodland and forest educator and a mentor? Well, here, obviously, there's Claire who's starting off there. You do it from your own example, but if you're not sure if there's any opportunity nearby, there is more for adults. Uh, there's the whole sort of forest school uh, network. Um, but the important thing is here is keep yourself breathing. Um, we got one pair of mind, one pair of hands, there we go. And maybe we'd be damaging the planet by labors, but this is something we can do. And part of your own tree sanctuary, especially creating, is that lovely little activity, which is more than just planting trees. It is that connection. It is that inner rewilding, the inner wilding, the inner placement, and the uh, inner sanctuary uh, that uh, becomes part of us. So what's this one? Right, there we go. So that's, that's the important thing. Keep breathing. The idea of the one thing we're, we're very much into knowing how to survive with our food. We know how to survive with water and we pay attention to food and water. We try and grow our own food. We, uh, we know our resources, where to shop, where to market, where our farm stores are. And we're very conscientious about our water and how we get it, whether it's from a mains water or a local water group or whether we have to have a well but we're there i think we take it for granted but i think we need to be much more responsible for our air and that's why i think part of the little tree sanctuary is a very good uh, part of that so a lot of people tend to have a bit of fear i think of woodlands so there's that thing of feeling the sanctuary so if we feel sanctuary in ourselves and around us and the synthesis of, of our senses, we develop a fearlessness and we develop a trust and we never stop learning from our inspirations. We're not scared of our inspirations. We're not scared of our voice. We're not scared to express that through our art or craft, through our writing, through our drawings, through our paintings, through our creations, or even through the problem solving. If you've got... If you say you're a code writer, for instance, you're in the tech business and you just can't get past a puzzle uh, with your code and your mathematics, if you've got a tree sanctuary, you suddenly be like Einstein. You suddenly, you're not, you can't manufacture a logical solution. You see it, you see it before your eyes and that's uh, what you copy. So just keep learning from your sanctuary. Now, the one thing, uh, uh, point you might have been seeing this. Let's see if I can bring this up. Um, that the the Sunday sessions. I hope this has been coming uh, through uh, clear for you. I am struggling with the uh, gear I've got, and we are struggling with the um, a little bit uh, with the the labyrinth gardens because of the cost of upkeep, and everybody's struggling in some form. But we'll put it out there because I don't want to charge for courses or the sort of large sums of money people charge for uh for mindfulness and stuff like that i would like this whole thing to just evolve and keep moving and progressing totally on donations 
And so I am, uh, each time I do make a, a donations request, I have got the Facebook fundraiser if you go to my profile. It is there. Uh, and uh, But you can, you, you can actually do this uh, donations through the PayPal, uh, me at uh, woodlandbard.com. So any, uh, a couple of euro or something, it all helps to keep, as possible we will open up the sunday session so after the online session uh you can actually share the labyrinths and we'll have a bit of a social at four o'clock the way we used to do things we can do the whole thing uh, it's just to help to fund that uh, a little bit so um say uh we this is going out through um the uh Karakori. Oh, join our Karakori Sessions Facebook group. We're actually going out live through the Karakori Cottage uh, uh, on Facebook. And this is also going out through YouTube. I don't know if there's a... I'll look and see if there's any YouTube. There we go. The Karakori Journal channel is on uh, YouTube. Um, anything else that I've got on the banners that I should be telling you about? Oh, there's also a podcast version. You can listen to this in the background. I'm always with it on Spotify. Look for Tree Sanctuary and you'll get the audio of this. So let's see how you're doing uh, there. Kimberly, what's a... Uh, there we go. Oh yeah, uh, no extra comment. Do tell... Um, well, let's go... Uh, right, well, the thing that's happened is, uh, is to tell you what's coming up. Um, it's, uh, I, I, I love the way you've got all these regular I'm going to go here to, there we go, what are we on now? And now, uh, to tell you what's coming up, as I say, there we go, usintrees.com. Um, now, how to, uh, where am I? There we go, and so next week, uh, the Sunday session, There we go. Let's get rid of that. It should be, should have gone. Oh, come on. There we go. Now, I'll try that again. There we go. Next week, the 12th on Sunday. A new one that got cancelled last week on the 12th, next Sunday, going through Celtic Dragons and Serpents stories. And I'll be bringing a lot of Orna Got and the local caves of cache here here and other stories around uh, because I, th I think this is so important the dragon serpents and snakes how the uh, symbolic of the movement uh, of nature the things in our lives and uh, because I, we get so obsessed i think with the linear and straight lines so i think these stories and this mythology the folklore of the dragon serpents and snakes helps us to look at things in a more entwiny, very relaxed way. And that's going to be on the 12th. So I hope you'll join for that. And then earlier on this year, uh, come on up. Yes, you're welcome. Uh, they're only sort of coming up halfway now. I wonder, come on. There you go. Uh, the week after the 19th, when I did the OM earlier, I think it was March, early April, there was just so much content. It was almost like this long-winded one just now. Uh, I decided to split it up into four sessions. So next week, because I had to skip it last time, going deeply into the OM, uh, the Ballymore Bard story, and it, it kind of connects up uh, with the scriptorium in Ballymore. Uh, where the book of Ballymote was done. And if you see there, there's lots of little page from it with little Oma symbols. And I'm going to go into the story of what led up to that and what has happened since. So that's going to be on the 19th. And then uh, for the... Right, there we go. For the last one in July, uh, because Garland Sunday probably won't be celebrated that much because of the lack of gatherings. So the 26th... Are we going into the Garland Sunday stories? Because a lot of people go to Garland Sunday events and they're very removed from their origins. But when you actually relate, like you go to a Garland Sunday here in Cage, there's dog shows and there's a baby show. And I'll explain how about why they have a dog show and a baby show. And I bet the people there have probably forgotten what the connection is then. But it's very important the dogs 
and the babies and the sports too. They have sports on Garland Sunday. So we're going to, uh, on the last Sunday of this month, uh, which is obviously a, a celebration before uh, Lunasa. So really, um, I think that's, uh, that's me for today. And uh, I trust you'll all have a safe and blessed and wonderful week uh, ahead. Keep well. And I hope I'll th keep making the comments. Let's, let's uh, have a quick check to see if there's anybody I've missed. Um, oh, there's a couple of extra ones coming in. Uh, and yeah, have a great day yourself. Uh, there's still plenty of it left, isn't there? Post a link to your fundraising page. Uh, it's very difficult. I tried that uh, for the Facebook one. If you look on my profile, it's not easy to put a link up on that, but they it equally well, as I say, if you go to my, um, where is it? I've lost it. Uh, that's terrible. It shows how business-like I am on this. Uh, where are ah, there it is. That will work. That will work. It, it will end up in the same department anyway. But thank you for your interest. Thanks. Uh, you're very kind. Um, so really... Thank you. Uh, let's see if I missed any comments That's before we go. Uh, thank you. Thank you all for being here. Uh, have a great day, great weekend, great week ahead. In Ireland, I gather we are actually going to, it looks like we can get some summer back uh, as from next Thursday onwards, and especially the following uh, week. So I think I've said more than enough. And I hope you enjoyed today. That is a lot longer than usual. I don't even know how long I've been on. Oh, boy. Oh, that is, this is the longest Sunday session ever. So I hope it wasn't too long. So I better say my uh, farewells and give you the, the, uh, the out. So till next week, I now say bye, good health, and a wonderful, lots of wonder. <laughs>